Well, welcome everyone. I have a very special interview with a man by the name of Fred Everett. So welcome, Fred. Thank you for being on here. Thank you for having me. So the reason why I wanted to do this interview, uh, Fred, is because um, uh, there's been another interview I did on um, a cancer survivor. And if someone gets the diagnosis of cancer, uh, unfortunately, it's, it puts a person in a state of fear and it's very hard to make decisions. And um, we just wanna give options. We wanna give options for people. We wanna give alternative solutions that you can look at and evaluate. And, um, and we're not saying to do this solution, but we are saying that there is stuff out there that you should know about if you have cancer. Now, F Fred, you were um, diagnosed actually in 2020 with colon cancer. It was a stage three, but it was on the borderline of a stage four, right? Correct. Yes, absolutely. And um, did you have, and I'm going to kind of go through this in little pieces. Did you have uh, symptoms initially that caused you to get a test? Yes. Yes. And that's where, that's where my story is a little, a little weird and where I didn't necessarily make the right decision. Um, I'm 50 years old. I've been a martial artist my entire life. I was born in a martial arts family, always had a pretty good, healthy lifestyle uh, from my parents all the way to my adulthood. Uh, we, I, I never had alcohol in my life. I never smoked. I never drank soda in my entire life. I don't eat junk food, uh, organic, been doing intermittent fasting for 20 years. So even though there's a, a colon cancer history in my family, both my father and my grandfather died of it. Uh, I was so sure that my lifestyle would protect me and that genetic wouldn't catch me. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't pay attention to the sign. I started to have inflammation visible on my skin, a little bit of psoriasis on my elbows and my knees. And then the inflammation got a little worse and I started having a little bit of blood uh, in my stool, looking at the color of the blood. I thought, hmm, that's probably an hemorrhoid or something like that. It doesn't look like cancer blood. You know, it's very bright, very light color. And I didn't do what I should have done. And if, if I did had a test uh, at that time, I would have probably caught the cancer at stage one, which mm -hmm. would have been a much easier battle. Unfortunately, I looked the other way. And uh, six months later, it was getting worse. So then I finally decided to get tested. I went back to France. I live in the US now, went back to France and uh, had myself tested and the diagnosis was there. It's a stage three, almost four colon cancer. Uh, one of the few that apparently are completely genetic. And, uh, and it, it, just like you said, when you get that diagnosis, you, you freeze, you don't know what to do. It's complete action and thinking inhibition. And it's really hard to fight the medical system and to try to see if there are other options. Yeah, I could imagine. I could only imagine. Um, okay, so you were diagnosed, and I think it was close to the rectum. The, the, was it a tumor, right? Yeah, yeah. It was a 10 centimeter tumor. So I don't know, maybe four inches, four, five inches. Okay. Uh, it started in the rectum all the way to the, 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 the lower part of the colon. Uh, because of the size, the doctors told me you have to go very fast. I mean, you have 50% chance of survival with your history plus the size of the tumor, it's, it, it doesn't look good. So you have, to be, you have to be fast. And what they offered me was 24 sessions of chemotherapy, six months of radiation, plus an operation at the end. Wow. And when I, when, I, when, I, when I heard that, and when I start looking at what are, my, what, what are the odds for me if I go that way, Immediately, I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to do something different. And, and I've been into ketogenic diet. I've been into intermittent fasting for quite a while. I used to do a little bit of prolonged fasting once in a while. So I, I knew that I had the tool. What I didn't know is why didn't those tools work before? And I have no idea. I don't have the answer. My answer is maybe I didn't do everything at once, which I did when I knew I was, I was sick. But uh, basically what I did... The moment, the moment I, I, I woke up from the three-day shock of the diagnosis, I did a 21-day fast. After mm -hmm. that 21-day fast, the tumor was reduced of 50%. Then I found your videos, 
and uh, and I start really looking into the ketogenic diet for cancer. And I went on a strict 100% organic ketogenic diet with intermittent fasting, one meal a day. And then a friend of mine started to send me some information about supplements. Then I met Guy, uh, who also was a big part of, uh, of, my, of my story. And then I started the, uh, the protocol that, that he's doing and that you and, you and he are, are looking into, I think, at the moment. So, so and, I want to uh, just I want to interject because those people that are maybe new to uh, this concept, uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Guy Tenenbaum who I interviewed and we worked together. He had stage four cancer and he no longer has cancer. And so um, you found his videos and there's a nutritional protocol that um, is based on some really interesting research that we also help funded and. Many of you watching have helped funded this research in Europe, which we just now completed. I mean, it took a while to complete it and get the research published, okay, in a major journal, which I'm going to put the link down below, which is very exciting. I'm going to do a separate video on that. But it's, it's a, um, you know, Guy's success um, was a combination of primarily fasting and of course the diet. Um, but this particular study was not looking at fasting because apparently mm -hmm. in Europe, uh, they, have a, um, they have a problem with fasting um, or putting my, mice through fasting because they think it's starvation or something. So, um, so we just did it in a nutritional protocol and the success was phenomenal. So, yeah. so in other words, when you got with Guy, he, he uh, kind of advised you on probably his nutritional protocol, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So the first step for me was the 21 day fast. Then after I went on a strict ketogenic diet uh, with intermittent fasting, that was the basis. After that, I implemented many of the things that I knew from my martial art training, breathing, meditation, ice cold bath in the winter, as well as the summer, uh, uh, mini trampoline to, to, to really reboot my lymphatic system. Uh, everything that I could think of, I tried to attack that cancer from as many angles as possible. I also did a, a mini psychotherapy with a friend of mine who's a, who's a psychotherapist doctor in France. And I, I really tried to, to, to see, okay, where, where else can I do something about that tumor? And then right. I finally met uh, uh, Guy and, and, and your, your research. And I implemented uh, melatonin, uh, green tea, vitamin D3, zinc, uh, and a few other supplements. To, uh, to really help me finish the, the healing completely. And bottom line, uh, I was diagnosed in September 10, I think. Excuse me if the dates are not perfect. I put everything in my book for those interested, all the dates and everything, but sometimes I forget. Um, and four months later, exactly on January 9, I was completely healed and, and, and cancer-free. Incredible. And so that was four months. You went from... Four months. You went from this tumor that was uh, 10 centimeters yeah, down to zero. Um, yes. So this is unheard of. And uh, so the doctors, now this is what I'm curious about. How did the doctors react when they saw that you, well, they probably blamed it on the, your, your, the medical treatment. I don't know what, what, or what did they say when they, you know, well, saw you don't have so cancer? I, after my after my fast, I did fa I did the fast the 21 day fast without any previous medical treatment. So that's the first thing I did, uh, and it was so encouraging that I I've decided to continue doing my treatment all natural. But I was in a lot of pain. I was in so much pain. You have no idea. It was I. If it wasn't for my my wife and and, and my family, I think at some point I would have just dropped it and jumped out the window. It was so painful. In the, gut, so, in, the, in the abdominal area? Yeah, yeah, rectum and abdominal area. So I talked to my oncologist and he said, okay, here is my offer. I know you want to do it naturally, but why, what, why don't we try six sessions of chemo instead of 24, just six, to reduce the tumor a little faster and then release some of the pain. So I said, okay, let's do that. Of course, I continued my research before doing the chemo. I found uh, Dr. Walter Longo's research on fasting and chemo. So I fasted and I only did three sessions of chemotherapy. So session number one, 
I fasted the day before, the day during, and the day after. No symptom, nothing. I was perfectly fine. The second session, I decided not to fast, just to go on a light ketogenic diet to see if it was the fasting who helped me or if it was my immune system or, or my body because of the martial arts. I, don't, I didn't know. So I didn't fast on the second one, but I was very, very careful with my food. I was sick like a dog, like a dog. It was horrible. The third session of chemotherapy, I fasted again, nothing, no symptom. And compared to all my friends around me when I was doing the chemo, I was the only one not to lose one single hair, nothing. I didn't wow. lose my hair. I didn't, I wasn't sick. I didn't lose much weight. I mean, because of the fasting, I really, really did went through the chemo quite, quite easily. So, so, so um, for those of you watching, um, it's important to know that when you fast, you greatly, greatly reduce the symptoms of chemotherapy. And yeah. um, I mean, you, it's almost like the body goes in this protect mode so that that's basically what happened right yeah absolutely and and like i said that was i was already i had a little bit of knowledge about it and i tried it worked and that's it so after three sessions the pain the pain was completely gone so i told my oncologist here in the us look i want to stop and the guy looked at me like i was crazy he said it's working it doesn't work on everyone it's working on you why don't you why don't you continue and i said no i got what i want the pain is gone. Now I want to do it my way. He finally said yes. They took away my plug, let me go. And everything else was fasting, ketogenic diet. And I was on a very restrictive ketogenic diet uh, because of my colon inflammation. I couldn't eat fibers. Uh, I couldn't take anything except organic grass-fed ribeyes and green vegetable juice. That's all I ate for three months, every single day, rebuys. And then people tell me meat gives you cancer. But for me, it healed me. But again, and I think you mentioned it a lot in your videos, organic, grass-fed, free-range animals. Yeah, grass-fed, grass-finished. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that's a really key point, uh, which is just because it's grass-fed doesn't mean it's grass-finished. Very important, especially for, um, I mean... There's a massive research uh, project going on that right now. I will put that link down below. I just talked about it. But so how did, when, you, when you finally, after three months, um, shrunk this tumor, what, what did the doctors say? What did they, how did they um, respond? Well, that, that was a fun, it was a funny day. So I go for my, uh, my last MRI. And uh, one of the nurses over there is a very good friend of mine. I've known her before the cancer and stuff like that. So... Once in a while, she looked at my file and gave me some updates before the doctor sees me. And it's what happened. So she calls me and she said, I had the results of your last MRI in front of me. And it's really weird. They don't, they don't mention the tumor at all. And they don't find any evidence. And she said, look, Fred, I'm not an oncologist. I'm just a nurse. I don't want to give you, get your hopes too high. You see the doctors in two days. Wait and see. So I'm already like, oh, yes. So I wait for two days, go see the oncologist. And he's there in his office and he tells me, he tells me, Mr. Everard, I don't say that very often in my line of work, but you are disease free. Wow. Wish you could, I wish you could uh, have said, can I put that on recording? Can I put that on the record? <laughs> probably uh, not, but uh, yeah. so, so it's interesting. You would think that you'd probably go, wow, what did you do? Let me, let me recommend this to other Patients. The problem is they, they're, the medical doctors are stuck between a rock and a hard place because they have to recommend this, the medicine and then they can't necessarily go outside the box. Yeah. Um, so that is the problem that the system, like you said in, in your other recording, the system is, is, is pro a problem, not the doctors. It's like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. And, and I am thankful. I am thankful to Western medicine to, to have taken my pain away. I'm thankful to my, my oncologist to have been open-minded enough to, to follow me you know, in my trip and, and yet keep following me with my blood test every month, my MRI every three months, my colonoscopy every year. So the, the guy was really following me and, and I am really thankful for that. But yeah, they didn't, they didn't really ask me what I did. They were not really interested. I tried to mention it, to mention fasting and believe it or not. And again, I'm not pointing fingers or anything. They do what they can. But during chemotherapy, 
the nurses go through patient to patient offering them coke and, and cookies just to make them feel better. And wow. when, they re- when they reached me, I said, no, sorry, I'm fasting. And I was about to tell her, do you know that sugar feeds cancer? But of course, in front of everybody, I didn't want to, you know, to make her feel embarrassed or anything. So where was my responsibility toward the others in the room or the respect for the, the nurse and the doctors? So I was in a, in a weird place and I, I, I didn't say much, but I told her, you know what, it's, I'm doing fasting and it really helps. And uh, at the end of the day, she bought my book and she was very interested, but the doctors, not so much. Right. Question. Um, did you find, um, like, first of all, you 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 probably didn't have a weight problem. You don't have a lot of weight to lose because um, I watched your some of your videos um, on your site. Um, what, how did you deal with fasting for 21 days with your weight? Did you lose a lot of weight? Tell me about yeah. that. So it's, it's complicated. I didn't have a lot of weight to lose. I was in, in the, one of the best shape of my life before the cancer. Mm-hmm. I was 70 kilos, which is, which is good for me. Uh, 9% body fat, 9 or 10% body fat. I was in big condition doing CrossFit, martial art, boxing, parkour. Um, and I was 48, 49 at the time. Uh, and thanks to that physical condition, it really helped me take also some of the, some of the, the, the cancer. But um, when, I, when I did my fast, I lost weight, but the worst was the months after that. So that's really where the cancer was the most aggressive. And that's when I decided to do, to do the chemo because I was in so much pain and the inflammation was so huge. And I went from 70 kilos to 49 kilos. There was nothing but bones and a little skin. Okay. Uh, the hard thing for me was to gain the weight back, which I'm almost there now. It's been a year and a half and uh, I'm 66, 67 kilos, a few more kilos and, and I'll be okay. But it, it took a while to get my, my weight back, but I never had problem to lose weight. Yeah, that's, that is always the challenge is how do you fast and keep, keep your weight or, because if you're thin, you know, it creates just a problem of how are you going to do this? But okay. So as far as your, your fasting now, um, you did a 21 uh, day fast. Yes. And then after that, you went to one meal a day? Yes. And then did you do any additional prolonged fasting after that? Yes. So the first 21 day fast was at the very beginning. Then I did one meal a day, ribeyes and, and vegetable juice, basically, because I couldn't take the veggies with all the fibers. Yeah. And uh, that was for three months until Christmas and December. And then Christmas comes and my mom comes from France to visit us and she's a Michelin star pastry chef. Oh, so okay. everything, I mean, talking about jumping out of the wagon, that was me for a week. So between Christmas and New Year, it was pies and pasta and pizza, everything. I was so frustrated that I couldn't eat before. So I had a week of cheat. And after that week, I didn't feel bad. I didn't feel worse, but the next MRI was coming in two weeks and I was a little scared of the result because of the cheating. So I did another 21 day fast, but not 21 days straight. I I fast during the week and ate during the weekend ketogenic diet. And I did that for three weeks. Okay. So so altogether on the weekends, weekends, did you do one meal a day or two? On the weekends, I went back to my routine of a keto diet, one meal a day. Okay. And, And nothing at all during the week. And that's where, at the end of that last prolonged fast, I went for my last MRI and PET scan and blood work. And that's when they told me, there's no more tumor, you're cancer free. Wow. So you did two 21 day fasts, but the second one was just uh, during the weekday. And, yeah. then, um, and then right now to maintain what you're maintaining, how many meals a day are you consuming? Usually one, but uh, sometimes two. It depends on my workout. It depends, you know, how much exercise I did that day. Uh, usually, I try to stick to one. Okay. Um, what about? Um, I want to know a little bit more about uh, before you had blood in your stool or a, a problem that you started to recognize, like there's some skin issues. Like, how many years ago was that? Was that like um, 2000, 2019? That was basically the six months before the diagnosis. So I was diagnosed in okay. September 
And from April, May, something like that, I started to have a psoriasis rush and, uh, and uh, blood on my stool. So what I'm curious about, and just you might, there not, might not be anything, but um, was there any other uh, thing going on like with your bowels? Did you, did you um, go on an antibiotic? Did you go through a lot of stress? Did you, um, is there any potential thing that could have triggered this thing right before you started having skin problems that you could think of? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So basically the Tehran was there because of my family history, but the trigger was definitely psychological. A uh, few things happened. Number one, uh, my wife and I were French, but uh, we used to live in Singapore. We, we lived in Singapore for 10 years and we moved from Singapore to the US. And the green card process was a nightmare. We waited for three years, spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. It was a lot of stress going to the embassy, being rejected, going to the embassy, being accepted. So that was a lot of stress and we lost a lot of money. That's the first thing. Second, COVID hit. And all mm. my schools, I have 20 schools around the world, uh, martial arts schools, and all my schools, they all close at one. So wow. no, no, no money, no nothing. And that's exactly when when I start to have the, uh, the symptoms. Okay. Makes a lot of sense because you just kind of kicked in those genes uh, from an epigenetic, which is above genetics. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, for those of you that are watching, um, there's some basic information you need to know, like cancer cells originate from normal cells. The mitochondria get damaged and then the cells start to adapt to this uh, kind of a prehistoric type of metabolism where it can now run on a different fuel, it can ferment fuel. So now it's, it's a cancer cell and uh, it loses its ability to die or commit suicide. Like healthy cells actually um, go through this process where they can, they only live for so long, but cancer cells can lose that um, in this certain state. So the real like everything that a person should do should kind of align it with um, preventing damage to the mitochondria and the cells. And, uh, you know, this is why you have like excessive chronic stress, um, carcinogens, um, chronic consumption of um, omega-6 inflammatory foods and mm -hmm. sugars um, that can actually create damage to the mitochondria. So, um, and then when you're um, going through recovery, there, um, there's so many theories out there, there's so much confusion, but what I would recommend someone is to, your primary thing you should do is um, fasting, prolonged fasting. Hands down, that is like gonna be the most important thing. But then there's a nutritional protocol. Um, see, there's something unique about cancer cells that I wanna share that I will do a separate video on this. The cancer cell, um, you have strategies of starving the cancer cell of fuel, um, but then you also um, have another strategy, which, which we did a study on, which you're, you're starving the cancer cell uh, from its structural membrane raw material. Um, so there's a certain um, pathway um, called, I don't, I'm not gonna tell you the long name, but it's called Scott. And there's a certain, like a door that you can feed the, uh, the cell, certain raw material that build the membrane around the cancer cell. And it's you, it's, there's a unique part of this that uh, it doesn't interfere with normal cells. So um, there's what's called Scott inhibitors that block, and there's natural Scott inhibitors that can block this pathway. And um, this nutritional protocol uh, took like a handful of these Scott inhibitors, and we did a study on mice, and we gave them this, um, these Scott inhibitors, and then we compared it to a control group that was taking a very powerful chemo drug. And um, it was twice as effective as that drug without the side effects. And that's not even using fasting. So mm -hmm. in other words, I would combine the nutritional protocol with this fasting. And I think you, you, did, you did that, but you also took it one step further, which I'm totally, um, I would totally recommend too with stress, everything you did to reduce stress and you did the 
you know, cold ice bath in the winter, which is very painful that you did those and you, you did everything, which, which is just remarkable. And that's what I would do to recommend to like, just start compounding and um, every little thing is going to help, but it's definitely yeah. a, a mind trick that you have to overcome because you have certain people telling you, Oh no, that's not going to work. And yeah. putting doubt in your mind, you have to go this route. But I would always want to know, and I don't know if you asked the doctor, did you ask the doctor if you did just the chemo, like they said, and the radiation, the surgery, um, what is the chances of long-term survival? And not just they five told me, years. They told me 50%. But as you know, they usually count, uh, they usually make, make their stats from three years, sometimes five, but no more. And according to many studies, which I'm sure you, you are familiar with, uh, after five years, it's closer to two to 3%. So the prognosis after five years, it's just like, they, they only go up, like if you survive five years, it's like a hundred percent success rate to them. I'm like, yeah, exactly. no, 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 it's like, no, we want to know um, long-term. And so that's where, that is where you need to, if you have cancer, start talking to the doctors about doing your research. Cause um, that's kind of an area, a, a big, huge uh, hole in the bucket where as far as long-term survival and um, okay. And so quality I, of life also. Like Quality you're you're alive life. after five years, fine. But what can you do? Right, right. And for exactly. me, it was critical because I'm a martial arts instructor. It's my it's my job. But uh, and there was no way that I would stop physical activities or, or 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 doing my things. Not only because it's my profession, but also because it makes me happy, and that's what I love to do. Exactly. But you were right before when you said cancer is multifactorial. Therefore, the healing must be multifactorial as well. Has and it's be. very important. And I, uh, for me, like I told you before, I used fasting, intermittent fasting, ketogenic diet, uh, ice cold bath, uh, mini trampoline, uh, the Scott inhibitor protocol, everything I could do. And every time you make a decision, there's another doctor, another study telling you, don't do that. It's the worst, like vitamin C. One of my doctor friends in Paris told me high doses of vitamin C, three, six grams. Uh, if you can't have IV, you do it uh, orally but uh, it's going to be limited, but six gram would be good. And some other people would, no, 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 no. Cancer grow with vitamin C. And at some point you have to make a choice and it's really hard. And I really feel for the people who are sick and don't know what to do. I receive hundreds of emails every day. People asking me, should I do this or not this? And I don't know, I'm not a doctor. Yeah. But for me, I decided to go along with vitamin C and D3 and zinc. And all the things that people said, ah, you know, we're not sure. We don't know. There's no evidence. Well, it worked for me. I guess the, the moral of this story, the lesson of this story is to you, you have to um, take it to the next level and you have to learn how to create your own health and not um, put it in someone else's hands. You really need to bite the bullet and learn how to create your own health on a daily basis because we have things that are countering our health. Uh, on a daily basis. So um, you can't just sit by and uh, let someone else do it for you. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And uh, it's, it's difficult because like we said at the beginning, when you get that diagnosis, it's, it's, it's terrible. It's really yes. hard. Your nervous system, your, your, your mind, everything freezes. And, uh, and all you can do is follow what the doctors are telling you. And they're doing their best, but they're not always up to date with the research and they have a protocol they have to follow or they can get sued. And it, it's, it's complicated for an oncologist to, to tell you, hey, why don't you do something else? But you have to do your own research. You have to take your, your survival into your own hands. It's your choice to follow the doctor's advice and protocol or not. That's a 100% personal choice, but it doesn't stop you from doing your research and, and going a little bit further than the information that the doctor gave you. And researching and learning about cancer, everything you can about cancer, for me, was a very important part of my healing. It was not enough that some doctor told me, you have cancer, it's almost incurable, here are your chances, good luck. No, I, I was not satisfied with that. Let's open some books, Let, let's go on Google and Let's go on the uh, PubMed and, and, and read all the scientific literature about cancer and, and fasting and cancer and ketogenic diet and cancer as a metabolic disease. And 
all of that, all those research, I spend night and day reading it and, and, and doing something with it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, someone gives you some, some, some data that you're like, that freaks you out. Just really make sure that you realize that may be an opinion. It's not a fact. And so a fact is different from an opinion. Opinions may or may not be true. Uh, facts are true. And so if someone gives you a lot of opinions. It's actually, it's probably worse than them. Worse. Than, it's especially worse if it's a, an opinion that could be based on um, incomplete information. So, cause unfortunately the the way the whole system works is there, uh, there's a lot of money to be made. And unfortunately, it's like you can't freely even talk about some of these alternative uh, treatments without being um, shut down. Um, so I'm really, really happy with this interview because you just shared a lot of great data for people to um, uh, use in their own healing. And um, so I wanted to say thank you, Fred. I'm going to I want to put your website down below and then um, just so people can see what you do. And uh, also you. Guy's website, Tundelbaum. Um, I saw that he tried to log on, uh, but just tell him I was right in the middle of the interview. Okay. But, um, and I will also put the protocol, if someone wants to know this nutritional protocol, I'll put a link down below. I'm not, I, don't, I do not sell these products. I don't want to sell these products. You have to find them on your own. Um, the last thing I want to do is give people claims that I have some magical cure. I am not yeah. going to say that. So, um, so thank you so much, Fred. I really appreciate your sharing. You. And uh, this pleasure. was very valuable and uh, we'll stay in communication. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.